Thank you, Afe, for that introduction, that lovely introduction. Thank you, Odette and Hervé, for having me here today. Um, so when it comes to scholarship on the Armenian genocide, um, the embodied trauma of victims of sexual abuse and forced marriage at times have been deemed too personal, too emotional to be worthy of historical study, especially within the debates about the Armenian genocide. Um, historiographically. Many stories have been held tightly as familial memories um, and have formed what Harry Haratunian has recently called, quote, the unspoken as heritage, unquote. The scholars of gender and for scholars of gender and sexuality, the unspoken can be observed in things like um, recorded testimony of Rupan Gavurian, who as an eight-year-old boy survivor was sexually assaulted uh, while working as a barn hand in, in a Kurdish farm in, in Kharpurt, which was actually his hometown area. Um, speaking through traumatic wails in his testimony, the elderly man recalled the violation, remembering how his assailant, Mahmoud Bey, closed the barn door while he was giving water to livestock and pulled him down from a ladder. Gavur remarked, quote, even then I knew what, what would happen. Uh, unquote. He said he described Mehmed Bey as, quote, a sex maniac, unquote. So the story of sexual violence, while central to the objectives of genocide, I would argue, is often relegated to a single page mention within existing historiography. So I'm trying to figure out how to advance. Okay. So um, in my book, Remnants, Embodied Archives of the Armenian Genocide, I attend to this silence by thinking uh, through and with the materiality of the gendered body uh, as an archive of genocide experience that com com communicates affective knowledge discarded by the violence of the traditional archives. Um, I argue that this form of material and affective knowledge can unlock ciphered bits of information or what I call remnants, borrowing, of course, from both Holocaust studies and Armenian uh, literature on that front, which Mark has reminded us of remnants and in its use in uh, Hagop Oshagan yesterday. The monograph situates the material body of survivors as a repository of traumatic experience, bodies that also form sites of resistance, where the memory of victims are preserved by their descendants as post-memory. Another thing I'm borrowing from Holocaust studies here. I also acknowledge along the way how the empirical impulses that I, I have had as a historian cannot fill the absences and erasures of marginalized voices left behind by the violent production of the archive. What I'm referring to here, if you don't know the literature I'm referring to, which is that you know states purge information, states control information. And that's especially true when we're talking about Ottoman sources. I'll show you some examples of them nonetheless. I believe that interrogating these impulses and absences are, is particularly important for us as historians of the Ottoman Armenian community. So um, I borrow from a few theories and I just wanted to introduce you to at least a few. Um, one is Claudia Card, who has argued that, um, you know, genocide is an attack on social vi vitality. Um, other theorists, and here I'm thinking of um, Alisa van Hoden, forgery, has talked about how um, a genocide attacks life force, and therefore it is an attack on the womb, it's an attack on reproduction. I mean, we can look at that through Raphael Lemkin's lens, but we can we get a lot more from gender and genocide studies, which has really flourished over the last uh, few, decade or two. And so stamping out this vitality is, is, uh, is how we, we can think about cultural genocide as well as the kinds of sexual atrocities we see in genocide. Forced assimilation in particular produces a kind of social death for the target, targeted group, and this was mobilized against the Armenians. Um, women were most vulnerable to Islamization because Muslim patriarchal order and sexual regulations within Islamic law facilitated the assimilation of non-Muslim or Dhimmi women. Um, and so for the Armenian diaspora, the tattoos that some women survivors bore, and I'll go back to my book cover, um, <clears throat> Tal isn't here, but I, you know, thinking about how he's reading photography, I have a lot about photography in this book, and I'm critically engaging photography in order to, for example, um, decipher some of this woman's story. Her name was Lutfi Belamjian from Eintab, uh, to decipher some bits of her story from her face, from the facial tattoos she wore. Not all survivors bore tattoos, but those that were absorbed within um, some communities of Kurds and Arabs that practiced 
tattooing receive these tattoos. And so I just wanted to gesture that there's another connection to this conference, which is like, how do we engage photography? And how is it that photographs like this might mean one thing to an Armenian, but mean another thing to perhaps um, a Turk, a Kurd, or what have you? Um, there's an openness to the communication of um, these images uh, that I, I, I found resonated with Tal, uh, with Tal yesterday. Um, and so going back to the Muslim, um, patriarchal order, I mean, um, you know, I'm arguing genocide is a patriarchal phenomenon. It also weaponizes the patriarchy of the targeted community. Um, the Armenian community was itself patriarchal. Um, have we had that conversation? Uh, not fully, but I think we need to have it. Um, we have scholars of gender and, the, and Armenian genocide and also Ottoman Armenians who are talking about this. Um, some of the patriarchal practices included things in which, in areas of Van, Armenians were taking second wives, for example, practicing polygamy, or where we had extreme patriarchal customs in the household that could be targeted in genocide to pull apart the family. And that's where we get to the genos in genocide, um, thinking about the largest, the smallest unit, the family, kin, tribe, all of these units, race, um, but the family pulling apart the family. And so it helps us understand those kinds of ritual cruelties, um, these performances of sexual atrocity in public, whether I have a whole whole um, you know section of the book that talks about denuding, to taking the clothes, removing the clothes um, is very important to dehumanization, to do the preparatory work for genocide, to make it easier for the perpetrator to perform his work. And, and that includes also various forms of demasculation, which we had, we have examples. And I, I, I don't believe in, um, you know, kind of inundating you with, with horrors. That's, that's not my point. Um, but there are, of course, men who are killed on the threshold of their family home. I mean, that's incredibly symbolic or taken to public uh, squares and flayed, or we have also um, the plucking of beards of, of priests, which is a symbolic emasculation. So I started to read these accounts and narratives through that framework to understand better how um, gender works and um, in genocide. And authors like Catherine McKinnon has argued, and many of these authors were mobilized around the Rwandan genocide, where rape as a tool for genocide which is another one of McKinnon's essays, she helps us understand why. Um, she argues many of these acts make women's bodies into a medium of men's expression, um, the means through which one group of men says to another what it wants to say, which is it means supremacy, we are better than you, um, and possession, we own you. We own you to the extent we can do this to your bodies. We can do this to your women, we can do this to your children. Um, but we also have much older examples, and this is where I, I play around with this term dismemberment, like the unraveling of community. So thinking about the community as a kind of a metaphorical body that is dismembered, there's the actual dismemberment of individual bodies, but there's this kind of larger dismemberment of community. Um, I was thinking about Isabel Yesayan, who wrote an, a report in 1919 on sexual violence and its uses in particular. Um, and she wrote, quote, uh, until a woman was taken away by a Muslim or bought, in other words, until her fate was sealed, she was the victim of repeated collective rape. So in 1919, Zabel was already writing about rape as a tool of genocide. And when she's saying women taken away by Muslims are bought and sold, um, you know, of course, for humanitarians abroad, they were very focused on the traffic in women, that discourse, and also there were actual slave auctions in the caravans during the deportations. Um, uh, many accounts contain those evidence. We know also places like Urfa, um, where where public auctions were happening, places like Ras Al Ain, which is in Syria. <clears throat> okay, so thinking about the, that kind of public um, display, I mean, I, I would argue, and I do argue that, you know, these public displays of body horror um, are deeply political. Um, they have been when we study, you know, various forms of pre-modern punishment, you know, where you have the sovereign dis dismembering the body publicly, whether in Europe or in the Ottoman Empire, enemies of the state. This is how their bodies were treated. And so I see all of these historical resonances here. 
And then I also argue that there's a kind of, um, I call it muscle memory within the Ottoman Empire, because there had been an effort in the late Ottoman Empire to stamp out slavery. And slavery was incredibly gendered, especially in the 19th century. Um, it was mostly women who were enslaved in the 19th century Ottoman Empire. So despite these revolutionary edicts, you know, in, in the tail end of the Ottoman Empire, slavery was still there as a memory. Slavery was still practiced in some households, especially on Circassian women, which Circassian women were Muslim and they were enslaved in the late Ottoman Empire. That tells us a lot about how gender functioned as kind of a, a, a lens through which to think about oppression and um, and slavery. So to turn to prosthet or to post memory, which I call prosthetic memory, um, you know, I I received a lot of wisdom from Marianne Hirsch and Leo Spitzer here when they talk about how a post memory that some events are remembered very viscerally. I think a lot of us, whether we're Armenian or Jewish right now, are remember having memories, tra traumatic memories that feel almost like first person memories. And I I think about this quote a lot. Uh, when they say post memories are events that were transmitted to them so deeply and effectively so as to seem to constitute memories in their own right, post memories connection to the past is thus mediated not by recall, but by imaginative uh, investment, projection and creation. And I'm thinking here about how um, we do have post memory works in the Armenian community, one of the most prominent being grandma's tattoos by Swedish Lebanese Armenian filmmaker Suzanne Khardalian, who I interviewed for my book. And here we can see the hands, the tattooed hands of her great aunt Lucia, who she interviewed to better understand her now deceased grandmother who, who bore tattoos and was deeply traumatized by her experience. Um, Suzanne Khardalian's work is a, a, a form of post memory, but it's, I would also call it prosthetic memory. And one of the reasons why I use the term prosthetic is that a lot of these memories are embodied. They are a remembrance of body horror in many senses. And for Armenians, the tattoos, though they had a very different meaning within the communities who tattooed themselves, took on the meaning of you know, the memory of forcible assimilation. Um, and even in Hardalian's um, you know, film, she calls them Turkish tattoos, but actually Turks did not practice this tattooing, but they, it's come to mean really the oppression of Turks against the Armenians. And I think that's where I see the connection with Tal and his work is that openness to interpretation when we see this kind of spectacle. Um, but embodiment also becomes important in recuperation efforts after the war. Um, I have some more different kinds of photos that tend to make people gasp, and I'm not using those photos today because I, I, I just don't, I'm not, I'm providing you something different. But this is a YWCA photograph from 1919 in Aleppo. It was in one of those traditional Arabic homes in Aleppo where Armenians were gathered and rescued um, by various humanitarians, beginning with the Armenian community itself. Armenians were rescuing other Armenians. It's quite an amazing story that Khachik Moradian has written recently, the Resistance Network. Um, but uh, we also have Western humanitarians from Europe, from, from Denmark, Karen Yape uh, from Denmark, and also the YWCA. But we know little else about this photograph. It was taken in eight, August 1919 and then never properly cataloged. We don't even know the name of the photographer. Um, but the, all the girls in the photograph have tattoos and as if they've been instructed to kind of look sad or angry at the camera, they're all posed in a very serious way. Um, there are other photographs from that day that are posed very different where the girls are more aestheticized and posed like odalisks, like um, more sexualized. Um, and I, I'm studying those as well. But I wanted to offer you an example of that kind of humanitarian effort because I spend a lot of time thinking about it and the idea was to recuperate those women, to make them into mothers, into wives, to rebirth the nation. And Lerna Ekmeksiolu has written uh, about this uh, a lot in, in the case of Constantinople in her book, Recovering Armenia. So I, I mentioned the violence of the archives and that the archives you know, really can't give us everything we're looking for. Um, and this is part of my I don't carry on the like, tradition of Derrida, you know, over 20 years ago writing Archive Fever. Historians have been thinking critically about um, archives. Um, and, and so in that way, I'm going to show you examples of a post-memory work that I think critiques the archive in a way that I think we should, should be modeling for ourselves. 
Um, but I want to show you also what the archives look like. You know, I don't want it to be what they say, a straw man argument where I'm just arguing against something you've never seen. So um, unlike, you know, Germany after the Holocaust, the perpetrator archive remained under the control of the state of Turkey. Historians have been instructed to produce evidence um, from that archive primarily while encircled by competing discourses of recognition and denial amid an ongoing attack on Armenian historical memory and even Arme the Armenian commun community's ancient cult cultural heritage has been under ongoing attack um, since the Armenian genocide over a century ago. And so what this has done is, an, is really produced a field that's, I, I, it's produced works um, of history that I think are, are uncritical towards the archive. Um, archival evidence is needed to fortify positions of acceptance or denial of the Armenian genocide. And in those debates, non-Turkish archives um, have been declared untrustworthy and eyewitness testimony even more so. So this is a major difference with Holocaust studies where the survivor testimony is it's the gold standard. And, and yet historians, we, we use oral history, but it's discredited by the perpetrator state as evidence. These are Armenian tall tales, so to speak, uh, from the Turkish perspective. So when we look at the Armenian, uh, the, excuse me, the Ottoman archives, um, uh, the Bashbakanlik Osmanlı Arşiva here, um, this is a model document where we can look at this document and it's actually a trace of an Armenian captive woman who wants to be freed after the Armenian genocide. Um, let's see if this works here. Here's my translation. And here we get um, direct evidence from the Ottoman archive of the story I've told you. However, just like the, the photograph, people can look at it in different ways. Um, and certainly some Turkish historians look at it as benevolent rescuing of an Armenian girl. Uh, well, here, here's what the, what the Ottoman archive says. Um, in 1919, this is after the armistice in which those girls were to be released by um, by treaty. Those those forced abductions and, and conversions were vacated by treaty, by international treaty. It's understood from the complaint that the gendarme company captain Niazi Effendi took an Armenian girl as a bride for himself by force during the relocation. So that is, you know, one of the officers just picking off a girl and taking her. Um, by force. The Armenian girl not being content with the above mentioned person nowadays wishes to go to her mother's household despite not daring to do so. This matter is to be dealt with and its results to be reported to the investigation. I did not find the follow-up, but what we have here, it's a very small trace of an Armenian woman trying to use like the legal structure and the state structure to release herself from a marriage she doesn't want. Um, and you know that's where we can find very small moments of resistance. Of course, there was resistance throughout the entire process, but I think this is important just to show what we can get from the Ottoman Empire, uh, uh, Ottoman archives, excuse me. And if it feels unsatisfactory, I agree. It, these are just traces. That's why I titled my book Remnants. Uh, we just get traces. Um, and there's been, I you know, so one of the things that I think, what I argue is you know what we get from the Ottoman state archive are what we could call paper cadavers. These are not, we get traces of, of Armenian lives, reverse negatives of lives, um, but we're not going to you know get really often the fuller picture. Um, we're not always going to get their first person voice, for example. Um, it's really the imprint of a disappeared Armenian body. I'm going to go back to this because I'm not ready for that slide yet. Sorry. Um, it's an imprint of a, a disappeared Armenian violent uh, body violently removed from its indigenous homeland. Um, and so what do we do with that? And uh, so one of the things that uh, a lot of, you know, activists have been doing, especially if we think about this within the context of the erasure of the overall um, Armenian presence in Turkey is get creative and mark out space. I think these artistic or even political protests of sort are interesting in showing us how people are trying to infuse memory back into a space that has been largely erased. And we saw this in the Gezi Park protests. Activists sought to reactivate memory of lost communities in the Gezi Park, um, which was, again, it was a mix of democratic protests combined with environmental 
Um, and there were minorities also involved, like the Nor Zartank uh, group, which erected a display of cardboard headstones to remind protesters that the site of Gezi Park um, was once the Sorpagop Armenian Cemetery before it was expropriated by the state after the Armenian genocide. And so you could walk through Gezi Park now, which now has, of course, there's a giant mosque nearby uh, that Erdogan has erected. Um, and you could look at Gezi Park. Um, some of the stones within Gezi Park at various point were headstones. So this really recalls what Georgios was saying about the Jewish cemetery and um, in uh, Salonika. Um, but here was an attempt, the artistic, you know, attempt to kind of reinstill memory, to reactivate these places with what I would call prosthetic memory or post-memory. So here's where we get another kind of source from the archives. Um, you know, I one one of the archives I found was one that belonged to um, Rupan Herian. Rupan Herian is a, I, I don't think he's that well known, uh, even within the Armenian community. He was an Armenian American. He had immigrated from the Ottoman Empire to the United States. And during the Armenian genocide, he decided to enlist in the French French Foreign Legion. So he went to the Ottoman Empire and they rejected him because he was too old. He was 50. They said he was too old to serve. So what he did is he created his own, uh, with, with, with collaboration from the Armenian prelacies in Baghdad and uh, Aleppo, he created his own sort of one-man humanitarian mission. Um, I learned about him through Anna Alexanian, who wrote an essay about him. Um, but what's incredible is he saved every scrap of paper he used during his one-man re rescue mission, names on the backs of like uh, cards, business cards and scraps of paper. He saved letters from Armenians, from the United States, from Europe, from uh, from it also regionally from Baghdad and Aleppo, he was receiving correspondence and looking for people's loved ones. They included descriptions and photographs of their loved ones. Um, and so in this case, one of the things he archived was a letter from a captive woman. For me, this, this was the gem that I found in, in the bunch. And here is a letter from Karanush Kuyumjian, who's now living in Raqqa with an Arab husband or or, or an Arab man, she doesn't list him as a husband, could be unmarried, could be that she's in a forced state of concubinage here. Um, so she writes, my dear father, I was very happy to receive your letter. Praise the Lord through his infinite favor. He rescued us from our enemies. Father, when I was made aware that you were alive, I felt so happy. And here it's very poetic. I wish I had the wings of a bird to fly and come to you. Father, I have two children here. One is Nazareth and the other from the Arab. Uh, when I received your letter, I wanted to come to Aleppo, but my son's Armenian father is not here and I have no money. So I beg my father to free me from this Arab. Um, go to the church and beg, talking about the Armenian prelacy in Aleppo. Beg again and again, I beg you to free me from here. Concluding my letter, I remain your beloved daughter. So what's there's information in this letter that I just want to point out, which is first... Um, she has she has retained the child from her Armenian husband, whereabouts unknown. I don't know if he's alive or not. She doesn't tell us. There's really no context for the letter besides what she's provided. But um, she still has her 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 son or child from from her Armenian marriage before the genocide. It's also an undated letter, by the way. So I don't even know the dating. And then she also. Um, has received letters from her father before. And this is the part I love because we know that Arme it's, it's, it, without the internet, which clearly the internet is making people stupider by the minute, right? But um, you know, without the internet, people knew were finding their loved ones, were corresponding with them from far away, putting advertisements in newspapers, describing their loved ones. Um, using photography in creative ways to offer proof of life. Some people who were held captive didn't believe their families survived the Armenian genocide. They needed proof. So um, sometimes Harian has photographs of, of either children he's rescued who are clean and healthy once again back in Aleppo to offer proof uh, of, of that, that they can be rescued or proof that their families have survived. And here we have in the records, I found that it was often these muleteers, these mule driving boys were hiding letters and carrying them or 
actually helping Armenians, you know, depart and make their way to Aleppo, where, sorry, where the large humanitarian effort was under underway. So she's receiving letters from her father, they're corresponding, and yet she's still struggling to get free. We don't learn whether she got free or not. Oftentimes, there is some marginalia telling us whether someone was rescued. In this case, we do not know. So I wanted to turn to something very different. I mean, in, in short, I'm trying to highlight how the, the kind of absence of information we have in the Ottoman archive is attended to when we embrace the Armenian archives, when we embrace alternative archives and alternative sources. But I also wanna move beyond that. It, I wanna move to a call for historians in particular who have yet to absorb some of the critical analyses of the archives found in other fields to heed um, the call to view archives, not only as a space for data extraction, but as a subject that should be approached critically. And especially considering the violent erasures of the archive, um, we need to counter them with critical readings. And one person who's doing this, at least in the in American academia, is Saidia Hartman and her work on um, enslaved African-American women. Um, she's called for what, what she calls critical fabulation. And it's it's what all it's what all of the artists and feminists are talking about these days. So I just want to let you know it's it's on trend. But critical fabulation is really a combination of historical archival work with critical theory, and then also reimagining to sometimes use fiction even to radically reimagine and fill the gaps left behind by, you know, genocide's erasure um, of history and past and experience. And so it's really a, a call for radical engagement by us, you know, by scholars, artists, makers, creators. And I wanna leave you with an impossibility. Um, so, so I know that the Armenians in this room will know what I'm talking about right now, but I'm going to still walk you through it. Um, auction of souls is something that has been recently re-implanted into Armenian prosthetic or post memory. Um, and it's really the story of a survivor here on, on crucified on a cross, Aurora Mardigian, renamed Mardiganian, was a survivor uh, from Chemesh Gizek um, in Turkey, uh, Ottoman Empire. Um, she went through the horrors of the Armenian genocide and she showed up in New York City um, where the press covered a, a beautiful young Armenian survivor has appeared in New York looking for her brother, Vahan. She never found her brother, but the Near East Relief Foundation found her and then helped her write her memoir. Uh, again, it, it's a kind of problematic transcription, but still she was working to sort of document the first memoir, if you will, um, about the Armenian genocide. And soon after, Hollywood heard about her and wanted to make a film. Um, and the film, the book, the book version of her memoir is called Ravished Armenia, but the film is called Auction of Souls. And in her recorded testimony, she documented how, how difficult the project was. She had PTSD, of course, which didn't exist back then, and was reenacting her experience for Hollywood to raise money for Near East Relief. Her project ended up raising $100 million in actual dollars back then. Um, this crucifixion scene, for example, took place on the beaches of Santa Barbara, which was transformed into the landscape of central, uh, central Anatolia or Western Armenia. And she remarked in one of her oral testimonies just offhand that one of the women actually died during the scene, if you can believe it. This scene was eventually cut because it was so graphic for 1918, 1919, when it was eventually released, that you know this scene and some others were cut because they were, they were too pornographic for the time. And the promotion of the film included Com private conversations with Aurora that you could pay extra money for to learn about her sexual violation, to learn about stories, quote, that only women can tell other women, unquote. Um, so of course this had a toll and she had an emotional breakdown. And after her emotional breakdown, Hollywood just hired four, four or five lookalikes to go to the premieres to replace her. And she was actually never paid. She had to sue for payment. It's a horrible story of exploitation that has been framed quite differently um, in the Armenian community. But the film importantly disappeared for seven decades and then a 15 minute fragment was discovered in France. 
And so I, I tell you this background story to help you understand why it's been important. We want to think about post-memory, prosthetic memory, these kind of memories of body horror and and how they figure into um, the Armenian imaginary. It's been important to think about how this memory disappeared for 70 years and kind of was re reappeared more recently. And we have post-memory works. Very recently, Ina Sahakian's Aurora Sunrise, which is playing everywhere. Um, Aurora Sunrise is, uh, I, I was able to watch it, even though it's, uh, I, I need to see it again uh, to offer a better proper analysis of it. But it is an attempt to really reconcile all these details about Aurora's life in a critical way, using the four or five recorded recorded hours of testimony we have of Aurora later in life, where she actually is able to better narrate what, what she went through. Um, you know, she was working through mediators, uh, she was working through translators, and then her story was translated again by Hollywood and sensationalized. Um, and so the post-memory work is one way to get to the ineffability, really, of this kind of violence and to Aurora's struggle to really fully tell her story. Um, Aurora Sunrise uses the recorded oral history at the Zorian Institute in Toronto alongside a beautiful animation, stunning animation of Armenian life before the Armenian genocide, and then um, combines it also with fragments of that 15 minutes of film. It's pastiche. It's, it's kind of woven together in a way that I think exemplifies this moment. But I want to leave you with a final example that I think gets to the the archive in a way perhaps better. And I was able to engage this more fully for um, my book. Um, so in 2015, which was marked centennial, centennial of the Armenian genocide, um, a, a Can Armenian Canadian actress, Arsene Khanjian, um, offered a feminist reading of Aurora's survival in Auction of Souls Performing Memory, which was performed at the Bar Gorky Theater in Berlin. And here she reinterprets uh, ravished Armenia in order to ingeniously amplify Aurora's voice. Um, she uses that 15 minutes of fragment uh, that was recovered um, and she layers it together with a stunning performance uh, art um, that I think gets at the various mediations of Aurora's story to powerfully place the moments in which genocide, her genocide survival story um, has in some ways been um, difficult to narrate even for herself. Um, and I think this this also helps us understand Aurora's meandering testimony that's often interrupted uh, in in you know in these recorded testimonies in Zorian. And it also shows at other points there's the sophisticated testimony she's able to sometimes offer in Armenian itself. Um, anyway, um, one of the things that happened during the interview process is that no one knew who they were interviewing was a star of a film that raised $100 million. And so her memory was so erased that during one of the Zorian Inst Institute interviews, she said at the end of the interview, are you not going to ask me about my film? Because the memory was completely gone. Um, anyway, um, the 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 thing that I found most uh, compelling about Arsene Khanjian's performance is that she uses this you know, analog overhead projector to write words like kissing to get us to think about what it means when Aurora in her memoir back in 1918 uses the euphemism kissing to really describe rape. Um, so to describe a kind of sexual violence, it's a metaphor for sexual violence. And so her inability to articulate or at the time, the idea that certain kinds of articulations would not have made it possible to publish the novel or the, the memoir, excuse me. And so this happens while she has two actors. Um, here, in this case, the female actor is forcibly kissing in a violent way, you know, really violent in his face, uh, you know, while, while this word kissing and the definition of kissing as a caress, as an embrace, as something loving is being revealed by Arsene. Um, she does the same with touching. Touching, a touch, a caress, a signifies attraction, reverence, or sexual attraction. So laughing. Laughing is what one of the terms that Aurora used to describe that kind of mocking, that public humiliation, where you know, women, women would be stripped and forced to do things in public that would be unseemly and then mocked, laughed at. 
Um, and this really recalls also Zabel Yesayan's 1919 report where she, she writes, quote, the tears, the lamentations, the prayers only serve to increase the joy of the sinister criminals and their bestiality, unquote. Those are her words. So it's, it's, it's confirmed in other reports that this type of frenzy uh, facilitated the killing. Um, so one of the things I wanted to say about Ar Arsini Khanji, and why am I not showing you a video of it? Um, it wasn't recorded and it wasn't archived. It's now a memory, right? Um, and so I think the brilliance of Arsina Khanjian is that she actually demonstrated for us the ephemeral nature of memory. Um, she enacted memory. And then at the end of the performance, I mean, as, as a historian, I have shivers saying this because it's just not, it's the opposite of our impulses. She took her materials and she shredded them on stage as a commentary um, on really, I think, how vulnerable memory is to loss. Maybe I would even venture beyond maybe what she meant, which is like to say the violent production of the archive. Um, um, but I, I think the idea that those traces were actually actively disappeared before the audience was um, a, quite a, a brilliant, um, a, a brilliant commentary on the power of memory and also the power of forgetting. Um, so as an historian, I just wanted to leave you, I think I've spoken my time. Um, a few ideas, you know, I view post-memory works or prosthetic memory works, it's very embodied on stage, as exemplary of, of the way that embodiment figures centrally in the way that genocidal violence is remembered by the survivor community. As a historian, I consider these creative artistic works that fill the void left behind by genocide's capacity to destroy not only the memory of a people, um, but mem but it is itself an act of memory side, you know, it is killing memory. Um, they are part of a more expansive archive that exists outside state control that I suggest historians should embrace, engage, and they are. But genocide dismemberment of the Armenian community, excising individuals from the collective, and often dismembering the material body figures heavily in these projects. And so dismemberment in the end has produced what we could think of as a mutilated archive that we're working with, that I think is emulated by Arsine's Arsene Khanjian shredding her archive at the end of her performance. So we have to work with this archive and the fragments within it that I call remnants, and I offer some samples of that today. My hope is that my book can model a method by which we can sift through these fragments and continue writing the stories that were too painful to tell. Thank you. Mm -hmm.